Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to be talking about a very cool concept in data science and one that gets used a lot called the Monte Carlo method. You know, I like to keep it really practical on this channel. So we're going to go through two real examples and then we'll finish by talking about the advantages and also most importantly, the disadvantages of using a Monte Carlo method to solve your problem versus some other way to solve your problem. So let's jump right into the first example. So this is kind of a toy example. We are throwing darts into the square whose sides have length 2. So you throw a dart and it's guaranteed to be somewhere in the square, but it is random where it's going to be. You're just throwing a dart randomly. And you can see there's also a circle inside of the square. The circle has radius 1. And the natural question, of course, is if I throw a dart into the square, what's the probability that the dart is in the circle? I think most of us, after we've taken a geometry and probability course, it's pretty natural how to answer this question because the probability of throwing it in the circle is just proportional to the area of the circle. So if we divide the area of the circle by the area of the square, we should get our answer. And what would that be? The area of the circle is pi r squared or pi 1 squared, which is just pi. And divide that by the area of the square, which is 2 times 2, which is 4. So our answer is pi divided by 4. Okay, so pi over 4 is the answer. Now let's consider a different way to solve this problem that doesn't take into account that we know anything about geometry at all. We're going to solve this purely in a simulation-based way. And I've written the pseudocode for that down here in green. Now let's go through the code because I want to make sure to understand the code for both this one and the next one so that we understand how you would actually write the code for a Monte Carlo simulation, Monte Carlo method. So we're going to set big N equal to 1 million. This is going to be the number of points that we are going to sample from the square, and each point is going to represent a simulated dart throw. We're going to set this variable circ equal to zero. This is going to be a running total of how many of those darts, or how many of the sampled points, also live inside the circle. And you can see that after we're done, after we do this simulation, we're simply going to divide circ by n, because that's going to give us the fraction of points, the fraction of darts that I randomly threw that end up in the circle, which is exactly what we want. That's exactly the probability that we're after. It's just that we solved it geometrically very naturally before, but now we're going to solve it purely in terms of simulation. I think this is a very intuitive thing for a lot of people. Maybe this is even the first thing you thought of to solve the problem. Let's just look at the pseudocode really quickly. So we're going to say for i in 1 to n, again, we're doing a million samples. And this is important because the more samples we do, the closer we are going to get to the truth, which is pi over 4. If we only took 10 samples, we're probably not going to get that close. 100 samples is better, but maybe not enough. Doing a million samples should be sufficient, but of course we also know that more samples means more runtime. More on that later. So we're going to say for i and 1 to n, we're going to sample the x and y coordinate from negative 1 to 1. So x and y are both independently going to be numbers that are sampled from between negative 1 and 1 uniformly y between negative 1 and 1, so I arbitrarily just define a coordinate system where the center of this diagram is the origin. And so if you kind of extrapolate from there, then the left-hand side of the square is at negative 1, the right-hand side of the square is at positive 1, and same thing for the y direction. So sampling x and y from negative 1 to 1 is going to exactly uniformly sample within the square. Now the final question is, does the point that I just uniformly sampled for a certain iteration of this for loop also live inside the circle? And we know that something lives in a circle if its x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to the radius of the circle. The radius of the circle here is 1. So we simply need to check the condition that if x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1, that means it lives in the circle, then circ plus equals 1. Circ is again the running total of the number of darts we throw that live inside the circle. So go ahead and pause. Go over the explanation again or write it down, convince for yourself, or even code it if you want. And you'll see that at the end of the day, circ is the number of points that we simulated that live in the circle. N is the total number of points that we simulated. So this division here makes a lot of sense. And now I actually coded this myself and I'm going to throw the answer up on the screen here for the estimate I got from the simulation. And you can see it's extremely close to the true value. And it doesn't take too long to compute, even for 1 million samples. So this is a good way to solve the problem if we truly had no idea how to solve it any other way. So we'll have a little bit more to say about this when we talk about the pros and cons. But let's move on to the next example, because I think this one better highlights why we would choose to use a Monte Carlo method, because this problem wasn't too hard. So it is difficult to justify writing code for it. 
but let's look at a harder problem where if we just don't know what to do, we can still get a really close answer using Monte Carlo method. So example number two says that I play a game where the probability of winning a round, so probability of win is equal to little p for each round. So for any given round of the game, the probability that I win that round is p. Now this game ends when I lose two times in a row. So for example, if I play the first round and I win, second round I lose, and the third round I lose, the game is over, and I've played three total rounds. The question is, if this is how the game works, what is the expected number of rounds that I'm going to play? Another way to say that is, on average, how many rounds of this game do I play until it's over, until I get those two losses in a row? Now, before I go on, I mean, you can even think for yourself, how would I solve this problem? What tools would I use? What formula would I write? How would I think about it? And before we get to the solution here, I think the natural way to solve it and the way I first, you know, kind of started writing equations down was, okay, we know an expected value is simply one times the probability that I play one round plus two times the probability that I play only two rounds plus three times the probability I play three rounds and on and on. So maybe if I add up all these numbers in this kind of infinite sum, I'll see some kind of pattern and I can get it into a nice closed form. Now I indeed tried that, but it was a little bit difficult. The math got a little bit out of hand. Maybe you'll have better luck with it. But then, you know, a little while later, I had this new idea. And I want to emphasize that even though I'm sharing this as a very simple looking solution, it took me a really long time to arrive at it. It took me a long time to think about it. And even when I did think about it, it takes some time to work through all the algebra here. So do keep in mind that there is a big time cost to solving this problem in a purely kind of algebraic theoretical way. But let's look at the solution that I came up with and see why it works. So we're going to let little e be the expected number of rounds that you're going to play. That is the quantity that we're after, of course. Now, it turns out that you can break this up into three very simple cases. The first case where you win the first round. So let's say you just start playing the game and you win the first round. Now that's as if the game started from scratch because that is basically saying that now whatever comes after, I haven't had any losses yet. So I'm basically starting the game from scratch. It's as if nothing happened. And that event where I win the first round happens with probability P by definition. And what is the expected number of rounds that I play in that case? Well, it's going to be one because I did take that first round, which I won plus e. So it's kind of kind of difficult to understand this. I would say it's not super easy, but I'm defining this quantity e in a recursive way where you see e on the left hand side and you see it show up in the right hand side of the equation as well. But again, the first part of the sum is saying there's probability p that I win the first round. In that case, it's like the game starts from scratch. So the expected number of rounds in that situation would be 1 plus e. e because I'm starting the game from scratch. Now let's look at the two other cases. Another case is if I get loss, loss. So I begin the game, I get a loss. I unfortunately get another loss and the game is over. This is the easiest of the three cases to understand. The probability of this is one minus P times one minus P, again, by definition. And what is the expected number of rounds? Well, it could only be two because once I've gotten those two losses, it's over. So I put two here. And the final case would be if I get a loss first, and then I get a win. That happens with probability one minus P times P. So that again is getting a loss followed by getting a win. And what's the expected number of rounds I play in that situation? Well, I've already played two rounds to get the loss and the win. So that's two. And then to that, I add little e. Little e again, because I'm starting from scratch. I got a win on the second round. So it's like I'm starting everything from scratch. Now, if you do all the algebra, you can solve for e, it's not too difficult. You'll get the closed form solution that little e is equal to 2 minus p divided by 1 minus p squared. Now, I want to be really clear here. This math here, if you didn't follow it, it's okay. The main point I wanted to get across is that it took me a while to explain this to you. It took me a while to work out the algebra, and it took me a long time to even arrive at the fact that this could be the solution to the problem. Now, what if instead of doing all that, what if instead of thinking about it at all, we just coded it? We took advantage of the high computing power we have nowadays, and we just took these rules that we were given in blue and coded up a solution and then estimated the solution that way. So I want to explain the code to you. Again, this is pseudocode, but it wouldn't be too hard for you to write this yourself. 
So I'm going to initialize the rounds to be empty. This is going to store the number of rounds that I play on various simulations. For i in 1 to 1 million, so I'm again doing 1 million trials, 1 million simulations of this game. And on each simulation, I'm going to see how many rounds I got, I got to play. So what do I do inside the for loop? I set r equals 0. r is going to be the number of rounds I played on this simulation. So currently it's 0, nothing. And n loss is going to be 0. This is the number of losses that I have gotten in a row so far. Now we have an inner while loop here. So while the number of losses is not equal to 2, again, that's straight from the definition of the problem, while I have not hit two losses in a row, r plus equals 1, so this says that update the number of rounds I've played by 1. So this just keeps going as long as I don't have two losses in a row. Then I'm going to simulate a random number between 0 and 1, and then I'm going to check if this random number is less than p. p, again, is the probability of winning a round. So for example, if p was equal to 1 half, and this random number that I chose in this step is less than 1 half, then we would say that I won the round, and therefore we reset n loss to be 0. Because when you win a round of this game, the number of losses you have in a row, by definition, is now 0. However, else, which means that we did not win that round, then we would update n loss to be plus equals 1. That means that I do have one extra loss in a row. And we just keep going, and eventually n loss is going to be equal to 2, because I got two losses in a row. I do rounds.append r. So again, rounds is a big list that throughout this whole simulation, it's collecting the number of rounds that I played in each game. So we append this little r to rounds, and at the very end of the day, at the very end of this for loop, after I've done my million simulations of this game, I return the average of rounds. So the bar you see on top is an average, and that's exactly what I want. What is the expected number of rounds that I play in this game if these are the rules of the game? So let's take a look at the results of this Monte Carlo method. If p is equal to 1 half, which is the probability of winning, then the true is going to be 6, computed straight from this analytical formula we derived. And I've showed the results of the Monte Carlo simulation here. So we see we get extremely close to the truth. But do notice that it took me about 10 seconds to get there. So it wasn't super fast. 10 seconds is not a long time. You can sit there. It goes by in a flash. But notice that it took quite a bit longer to do a million rounds of this Monte Carlo simulation than this much easier Monte Carlo simulation. And we'll touch on that point again in a moment. Okay, so this was our second example. And the big takeaway I want you to get from this is not, you know, this example at all. This is not a probability solving video. This is a video which is trying to show you that some problems can require a lot of thinking, clever problem solving, kind of bashing your head on the paper for a while, can't get the answer. But if all you're after is that number, all you're after is the expected number of rounds for some given value of p, then you might as well just code a solution. This didn't take too long to write, and then you'll get pretty close to that answer. And if you want to get even closer, just make the number of rounds bigger. You can get even closer, arbitrarily close as you want, if you're willing to wait that long for your process to finish. So Monte Carlo methods can be a very easy way to get the answer to a problem which is otherwise difficult to solve. And that's a great segue into talking about what MC is, MC is Monte Carlo, what it is and what it is not. Because so far everything I've told you makes it sound awesome but we like to think about things from every angle on this channel, so let's talk about pros and cons now to close the video. So as we were saying, Monte Carlo is easy. Even if you haven't thought of a clever way to solve the problem, you can just code it yourself and get the answer to some arbitrary degree of precision. And kind of to talk about that more, let's say that it's a problem in a subject area that you're not familiar with, like genetics or stock trading or something. As long as you have the rules of the problem, it doesn't really matter if you're a subject matter expert or not, you can just code this and get the answer anyways. So it helps people who are in maybe not necessarily the same field still arrive at practical results to these problems. So that is one of the big pros of Monte Carlo methods. And this easy I put in quotes because sometimes the code you write does get kind of long, kind of out of control, so you have to be careful there. But it can be easier than going through the calculus or linear algebra or whatever you need to solve the problem analytically. And I also put sometimes fast. It took not too long to get my answer, but it's not always going to be fast. And that leads me into these next two points, which I'll talk more about. And this is what Monte Carlo methods are not. So it isn't always fast. So I just said it was sometimes fast. Now I'm saying it's not always fast. But the point I want to get across is that 
It seemed reasonably fast for our examples here, but it really depends on the exact problem you have. Even if we look at this problem still, if we look at a p-value that's not one half, if you look at something bigger than a half, you're gonna see problems start to arise. And to get an idea of that, I've graphed this equation. So this equation is again, the analytical solution to our problem number two here. And this graph looks like this. What this is telling me is that as the probability goes from zero to one, the expected number of rounds I'm gonna play this game goes to infinity. That is not good news for the Monte Carlo simulation if P is indeed large. What that means is that when I'm inside this loop, this is gonna run for a long time if P is large because it's barely ever gonna see two losses in a row. Indeed, if I put up the full table of results here for P is equal to one half, P is equal to 0.75 and P is equal to 0.9, you see this big issue of how long it's taking. It's still getting close to the truth in all cases, but it is taking longer and longer and longer to get me the answer. In fact, if I push this to the extreme, p is equal to 0.99999, this is gonna take me hours or even days to finish, depending on how big I've set p. And that can be seen analytically here. It's going up like this. It's not going up linearly or anything nice like that. It's going up in this very nasty exponential type curve. So that's why Monte Carlo methods are not always fast. They can be fast depending on the exact parameters you put in, but depending on the complexity of the problem or the exact parameters you put in, they can take a really long time and become impractical to use. And kind of just a side note on that, I didn't write this, but for different values of P, notice that this whole Monte Carlo loop was only for a single value of P. So after I do this whole loop and I wait 10 seconds, I get the answer for P is equal to one half. But what if I want the answer for p is equal to 1 fourth or p is equal to 0.1? Then I have to run this over and over and over again. Another disadvantage of Monte Carlo methods is that they're not generalizable. Just because you have a result for some value of your parameter doesn't mean you can say anything about the result for a different value of your parameter. On the other hand, if we solve this analytically and got this closed formula, we can get all of the answers in a very short amount of time. We can even graph them like this and see what the trend is. That's just something you cannot get with Monte Carlo methods. And that leads real well into the very last, and in my opinion, the most important disadvantage to keep in mind about Monte Carlo methods, which is that they are not interpretable. So true, if you care about only the final number and getting close to the final number, then Monte Carlo methods could be a good tool. But if you care at all about how you got there or interpreting the result, as we often do in data science and math and stats, then Monte Carlo methods, unfortunately, are not your friend. Notice that even in this very simple example, knowing that the answer is pi over four tells you about how we got to the answer. Because when you see a pi, you know there was a circle involved, maybe the area of a circle. And you look at this four and you would say, oh, that's two times two, that's the area of the square. So looking at this true form tells you the whole story about how we arrived at the solution and the nature of the problem. Looking at just the numerical answer might be enough for some practical purpose, but it doesn't help you understand the nature of the problem, which could be a big issue down the road if you're trying to generalize this idea. And similar notes here. I think we've kind of beaten this example to death, but note that having the exact number in this case doesn't tell you anything about the formula or this process at arriving at that final number. So Monte Carlo methods, unfortunately, are not interpretable. That's the price you pay for getting a quick solution to the problem, which is approximately correct, is that you have absolutely zero idea how you got there. So these are what Monte Carlo method is and what Monte Carlo methods are not. So I want you to keep all that in mind when you decide whether I'm going to use them or if I'm going to tackle the problem in a more analytic way from first principles. Both have their pros and cons and depend on your situation. Okay, so that's all I had to say about Monte Carlo methods. Um, if you wanna see a coding video on Monte Carlo methods, please let me know. Um, otherwise, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this and see you next time.